Good afternoon, good evening, good morning uh, to everyone joining us to this very special commemoration today. As you heard, my name is Tali Nates. I'm the founder and director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, and I will be your program director today. I would like to warmly welcome all of you who are joining us from really all over the world, from, from uh, Asia, from Israel, from Mauritius, from Africa, from South Africa, uh, all around the world to join us in this historical event, the 80th commemoration of the drowning, the sinking of the Patria, the Patria disaster, and the deportation of the 1,580 Jewish detainees to Mauritius. Special welcome to all the dear ex-detainees and their families, including those of you who survived the Patria disaster or watched the Patria disaster. Very warm welcome to our Holocaust survivors, to our guest speakers today, Dr. Susanna Pavlovska, Dr. Giora Goodman, Oscar Langsam, Ronnie, Dr. Ronnie Michela Rielli, and Owen Griffith. To all our dignitaries, to Rabbi Silberhaft from South Africa and the African Jewish Congress, to Anne Harris of the African Jewish Congress, to yes, all mother. dignitaries. To who generously shared their memories with us and to all our Mauritian friends. I welcome all esteemed academics that are joining us today, to colleagues from Holocaust museums from around the world, to friends and of course to colleagues from the Durban and Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Centers. Ladies and gentlemen, Warm welcome. It is a pleasure for the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center to partner with the Tel Aviv University's Lester and Sally Entin Faculty of Humanities, the Chaim Weizmann Institute for the Study of Zionism in Israel, the Boba Sound Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center, and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Southern Africa in today's commemoration event. Special thanks to Dr. Roni Michelarielli and to Professor Moti Golani and the teams of all the institutions uh, who work tirelessly to make this event possible. Before we start with the official program, it is my absolute pleasure to officially today launch the website of the Boba San Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center. And allow me to share my screen and show you this beautiful website. Uh, the address is now posted in the chat for you to go and explore it yourself. As you can see, the website tells the story of the detainees it also tells the story of the memorial itself. It is full of pictures. It has information how to visit the island of Mauritius and the memorial one day when the, when the pandemic is over or if you're lucky and you are in Mauritius, please do come and uh, visit the, the museum if you did not do so before. And has lots of podcasts, webinars, uh, all sorts of little films and radio interviews and other uh, information that you can find. And as you can see, it is in English and in French. So I really uh, hope that you explore it. We worked hard on it and we are very proud that this website is now available to all of you. Also, if you are on Facebook, please do join and follow the memorial, the Boba San Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center 
also on Facebook. Now, we can start officially the proceedings and to welcome us to the event, I invite Owen Griffith, president of the Island Hebrew Congregations of Mauritius and the chair of the Bobasan Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center who will deliver the opening address. The floor is yours, Owen. Many thanks, Tali. Appreciate your, your words. So greetings to all attendees and especially ex-detainees and their families. As the president of the Jewish community in Mauritius and as the chair of the Bobasan Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the Patria disaster and the subsequent deportation of Jewish refugees to Mauritius. I'm pleased that there are so many participants in this highly emotional and historically important event, which follows on from the event we held in August for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Jewish detainees held in Mauritius. The commemoration today is about this globally little known story of the sinking of the ship Patria in Haifa Harbor. This is of course tightly linked to the plan by the British authorities to deport to Mauritius approximately 3,500 Jewish refugees who having successfully escaped from Nazi controlled Europe had arrived in mandated Palestine in 1940. In a retaliatory response to this planned deportation, the underground military organization of the Yishuv in Palestine, the Haganah, decided to sabotage the deportation ship, the Patria. When the bomb exploded at 9 a.m. on the 25th of November, 1940, the Patria was carrying 1,770 refugees who had been transferred from two ships, the Pacific and the Milos, that had arrived in Haifa at the beginning of the month. It also carried on board 134 passengers from the Atlantic, which had arrived the day before the bombing on the 24th of November. Most of the passengers were rescued after the sinking by British and local Muslim fishermen boats that rushed to the scene. However, tragically, around 260 of the Jewish detainees on board the ship at that side, on that time were killed. The tragic death of so many detainees and others must have weighed very heavily on all those concerned in the planning and execution of the bombing of the Patria. Did they do the right thing, you might ask? Was it a mistake to have carried this out? Hindsight is, as they always say, 2020. Who could have not wanted this deportation to stop? Everyone wasn't sure what would have happened to these detainees who, having arrived in the promised land and been in prison, were now faced with deportation. What would happen to them in, when they left mandated Palestine? What dangers would they face? Would they ever return? No one at that time knew. And now 80 years on, can we pass judgment on this tragic act? We all know that the bombing of the Patria was however, partially successful in that the 1,500 survivors from the Patria sinking were not deported by the British. Only the Atlantic passengers who were not yet transferred to the Patria were eventually sent to Mauritius, 1,580 of them. Of those, tragically, 128 died in Mauritius. Those who were still in Mauritius at the end of the war in Europe were allowed to finally go back to British Mandate Palestine after four years and seven months of detention in Mauritius. That was on the 11th of August, 1945 when 1,307 detainees boarded the ship, the Franconia in Port Louis for the two week voyage to Haifa. Furthermore, 60 children were born in the prison. One of them, my good friend Tali Regev, is the honorary consul of Mauritius in Israel today and who is also with us for this webinar. I think this is also a good opportunity to mention to those of you who are not aware that with the support of the African Jewish Congress 
and the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, we have established in Mauritius a permanent exhibit next to the Jewish detainee cemetery at Beauvaisin. This exhibit explains the story behind the Jewish detainees. It talks about the hardships they endured, but also their resilience, how they succeeded in creating a sense of community and how they struggled tirelessly to regain their freedom. This is known as the Beauvaisin Jewish Detainee Memorial and Information Center, and it is staffed and open three days a week. And on that note, I would like to end. But before doing so, I want to thank those who made today's virtual function possible. Dr. Rani Micheli Ariely from the International Institute of Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem, our dear friend Tali Nates of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, the Chaim Weizmann Institute for the Study of Zionism and Israel at Tel Aviv University, and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation South Africa. To you all, a very hearty thanks to the Rabba. And now I'll hand it back to you, Tali. Thank you so much, Owen, uh, for your uh, um, opening address, for, for making us understand the connections uh, to the Patria and to the deportation, which we will explore more in today's event. Now, it is a great honor to introduce to you Oscar Langsam. He pre-recorded and edited this message to you, his keynote address and testimony as he witnessed the Patria disaster. Oscar Langsam is an ex-detainee who was born in Danzig in 1931. He witnessed, as I said, the Patria disaster from the deck of the Atlantic and was later deported with his mother to Mauritius. Now we will listen and learn from Oscar about his full story. Shalom. My name is Oscar Langsam. I'm 89 years old and I was born in Danzig, now Gdansk, Poland. In 1940, the war was progressing. All over Danzig, Jews were fleeing to save their lives. We felt the danger approaching. I was nine years old. I stayed with my mother and my little brother Hermann because dad left to find a place of refuge for our family. He sent us a postcard with his new address, instructions for mom, kisses to the children and a hesitant promise that we would meet again. On September the 3rd, 1940, we were taken on a train from the central station of Danzig to Bratislava, together with a group of about 500 people from our community. Here, on September 4th, we boarded the Donau Dampfer, the Danube ship Helios under the swastika flag. After one week on the Danube, our ship arrived in Tulcea, the Romanian port at the Black Sea. Here, to our surprise, the ships Atlantic, Milus and Pacific waited for us and we were transferred to the Atlantic. It was an old and very small ship with a Greek crew People were packed together like sardines. On the lower deck of the ship was the hospital ward. And strangely, around the ward were little cabins where mothers and children were accommodated. Here, my little three-year-old brother, Hermann, contracted typhoid 
He died later in the athlete detention camp. The journey on the Atlantic was a traumatic experience. There was a great shortage of food and biscuits from the emergency food reserve were distributed. The biscuits were covered with mold and we had to scrub it off. Some typhoid patients died on board and were thrown into the sea. At some stage, the Atlantic ran out of coal and it was decided to strip the ship of all unnecessary wood, even mass, and to use it as fuel for the ship. The Atlantic looked like a ghost ship. On the 8th of November 1940, the captain of the Atlantic refused to continue and on our journey, claiming that we had very bad coal to continue with. We knew that the real reason was that he was afraid to continue, as it was an illegal voyage. There was no other choice. Our people took over the ship and the captain was confined in his own cabin. Later, the crew of the ship agreed to continue with their work, but the captain had lost command of the ship. When we arrived in Palestine, we saw the two other ships, the Pacific and the Milus, in Haifa port. The British commissioner, Sir Harold McMichael, did not allow the refugees to leave the ships. The British authorities had prepared a bigger ship the Patria, to deport the refugees to the island of Mauritius. I was standing in line with my mother Esther and little brother Hermann, waiting for the ferry to take us from the Atlantic to the Patria, when I heard an explosion and saw how the Patria tilted sideways and began to sink quite quickly. About 260 people drowned and those who were saved were interned in a separate camp in Atlit. According to international law, people who were saved from a sinking ship in a harbor could stay in the country and they were allowed to stay. Later we learned that the sinking of the Patria was a Haganah action with two real blunders. The people who had remained on the Atlantic were put on a separate section of the athlete camp. Here in the athlete camp, my little brother died of typhoid. British authorities did not allow us to go to the funeral. After 10 days, we got word of a British intention to deport us to Mauritius. The Haganah passed on to us an order to make passive resistance against the deportation. Everyone should remain naked in their bed and not pack their belongings. British soldiers were called to break the resistance. They started with the men's hut and used brutal force. The resistance of the men broke and they started to go naked, some only with a blanket on them, to the lorries that were to take them to the deportation ship. The women saw the men walking and followed suit. On the 9th of December 1940, we were taken together with the rest of the Atlantic passengers from the athlete camp and transferred on to two ships, the Johan de Witt and the New Zealand. 
and departed to the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. After about 17 days, we reached the island of Mauritius and were put in a detention camp. Men were separated from the women and children. Life in the detainment camp was difficult because it was a prison compound surrounded by walls. I was housed in a separate barrack in the women's camp, known as the boys' room, together with eight boys. My mother was in a very bad mental condition. She was in deep grief due to my brother's death. and she cried constantly and couldn't sleep. I couldn't help her a lot because I had to abide by the rules of the camp, go to school, participate in community life, be present at the morning lineup and take part in sports activities. The only thing that saved my mother from insanity was her work in the detainment camp kitchen. Our life on the island was quite reasonable compared to camps in Europe, but still we were not free people. One of my most vivid memories from my time on the island was my bar mitzvah. I began my studies with Rabbi Dr. Bila from Danzig. He taught me the Torah portion and conducted the ceremony. After reading my Torah portion, Dr. Bila put his hand on my head and said, May God protect you with tears in his eyes. In August 1945, after almost five years of detention, the British government allowed the detainees to return to the land of Israel. I settled with my mother in Rehovot, where I live to this day. Thank you so much, Oscar, not only for sharing with us your very moving uh, testimony uh, in, in your full story, but also for recording yourself, for editing, adding the music, the pictures. Um, you know, you are maybe 90 years old, but uh, may you live until 120 and uh, continue to edit and create films such as that. We really deeply, deeply thank you for, for your contribution. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Ronnie Michela Rielli officially to you. Her name was mentioned many times before. She will chair the panel with Dr. Susanna Pavlovska and Dr. Giora Goodman, which be, will be followed by Q&A, and we will encourage you all to post already your thoughts, your, uh, your comments, and your questions in the chat. Dr. Ronnie Michela Rielli is a cultural historian interested in the intersections between Holocaust memory, contemporary Jewish history, and human rights. Uh, Dr. Rielli is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, working on her research project, Jewish Deportees in Mauritius, 1940 to 1945, a history from the margins. Thank you, Ronnie. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Tali. And I would like to open by thanking all of you for being here today. Uh, if I could, you know, transfer the, the beats of my heart uh, right now to you, if you could have hear how emotional I am and excited to see all of you. Uh, it's really, I'm speechless, but I'll speak nonetheless. Um, what is the connection between the Patria disaster and the deportation to Mauritius? Besides the fact that both traumatic events occurred 80 years ago and ever since have been neglected from most accounts of World War II, the Holocaust, the British mandate uh, in Palestine history and the history of Zionism, there are some more direct connections to be discussed. Before heading to our, our two wonderful speakers, I would like to shortly outline some of these connections. And uh, Oscar mentioned, and Owen before him uh, already uh, mentioned the, uh, the journey of uh, the four ships who set sail from Bratislava carrying 3,500 Jewish refugees. Uh, and a week later, those refugees arrived in Tulsa and uh, uh, set sail on three very old ships, Atlantic, Milos, and Pacific, to begin their journey to Palestine. And there is much to say about the journeys of these three overcrowded ships. However, due to time constraints, it will need to be told in a different event. However, in early November, after a very long voyage uh, uh, under impossible conditions, the Pacific and the Milos were captured by British forces in the middle of the sea and were brought to the uh, Haifa port. And due to the 1939 British White Paper, which enforced a strict immigration quota for Jews entering Palestine, the arriving immigrants were transferred to the Patria uh, to be deported to Mauritius. And when the Atlantic arrived in Haifa, about two weeks later, the British forces started to transfer the passengers to the Patria, where, as we heard from Oscar's testimony, uh, some, when some of the Atlantic passengers were already preparing to be moved to the other ship, an explosion was heard from the Patria, uh, and it was uh, an action made by the Haganah uh, in order to sabotage the ship, a decision that caused the tragic death of 260 Jewish refugees. While the British authorities permitted the survivors of the Patria to remain in Palestine, uh, the 1,581 of the Atlantic passengers were kept in a separate section of that fleet camp. And on the night of December 8, they got word of a British intention to deport them to Mauritius. On December 9, the Atlantic passengers were, were violently deported from that lead camp. The violent deportation was described by Moshe Char, uh, Chartuk, Moshe Charet, then head of the Jewish Agency's political department in Jerusalem, who stated, and I quote, a terrible act was committed in Atlit, of which we haven't experienced before. I say the Atlit the disaster could have happened even without the Patria disaster, even if the Patria was already on its way to Mauritius. Indeed, already in October 1940, more than a month before the refugees arrived in Palestine, the Secretary of State for the colonies, Lord Lloyd, turned to the governors of Mauritius and Trinidad, asking them to accommodate some of the expected arriving refugees in their colonies. He stated, and I quote, the problem of uh, illegal immigration into Palestine, which has caused a good deal of trouble in the past, has once more became acute. All these immigrants now come from enemy or enemy occupied countries. We have no check whatever over them. More than that, on November 21st, the, uh, the British Prime Minister office responded to Lord Lloyd's uh, uh, deportation plans and stated, and I quote again, internment in Mauritius is not so conspicuous, but I wonder if the colonial office naturally concerned with the effect on the Arabs takes sufficient account of the serious political agitation to be expected here 
and in the United States. In any case, Churchill could not contemplate the establishment of a concentration camp in Trinidad on the doorstep of America. So these documents demonstrate the marginalization of the deportation to Mauritius in the British colonial imagination. It reflects the conception of Mauritius as invisible to, due to its geographical peripheriality compared to Trinidad, which is located closer, close to America. Moreover, it provides a window into the British mandate authorities' perception of the Jewish refugees, not merely as illegal immigrants, but as a possible threat due to their places of origins, Nazi controlled Europe. Not only that the refugees were violently transferred from the athlete camp to the Haifa port, they were escorted by a military convoy and had to go through what the British authorities uh, refer to as customs examination, in the course of which watches, glasses, and other private belongings were confiscated. Moreover, Arod Zwergbaum, a young lawyer with Zionist leanings, originally from, from Prague, who served as a leader among the detainees in Mauritius, and whose son, Naftali Regev, is with us today, and is one of the babies who, who were born on the camp, wrote in his diary on the deportation ships, and I quote, during the first days, the refugees were kept in the holds of the ships, which were unbearably hot. On one of the ships headed to Mauritius, the man's hair was cropped close, not for hygienic reasons, but in order to annoy and humiliate them. On the same ship, they were not permitted to celebrate the festival of Hanukkah because the police commander claimed that this holiday was already over. And these descriptions also suggest that the deportation was part of a carefully devised policy, which was a reflection of an essentialist view of the Jewish immigrants as potential enemy agents, merely due to their European citizenship. While the detainee, the, the British authorities could not send the Jewish immigrants back to, the, uh, to enemy countries in the midst of the war, the authorities' ill treatment towards the immigrants implies for a demonic perception, which can be closely related to that of enemies. Did the British authorities suspect the Atlantic passengers were involved in the Patria disaster? At the time of their deportation, two weeks after the disaster, this is not indicated in the archives. In any case, when the refugees arrived in Mauritius, they became European detainees and were held in a prison converted into a camp. While there was undoubtedly an immense difference between the British detention camp in Mauritius and a German concentration camp, the British actions and policies implied that the Jews are not entitled to equal rights like other people, but ought to be content with any status that was better than outright persecution. I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Susanna Pabloska, to discuss, to, to discuss the faith of the patria. Dr. Dr. Pavlovska is the head of the Department for Education and Culture of the Jewish Museum in Prague since 2011. She studied at the Charles University in Prague and also at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. In 2019, she finished her PhD studies and wrote her a dissertation dedicated to the topic of women's role in the Haskalah. Currently, she is the chair of the educational working group within IRA. Dr. Pavloska, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, I have to say that I'm really moved by the story of Oscar. And I'm so glad that I can see you on the screen. And it's really hard to start to talk now because it was so moving that if you will be with me in Prague, and you will have the nice view like I to see the Jewish cemetery. It's next to me in Josephov. I will just give you a big hug because it's, uh, it's amazing. Thank you so much that I was able to listen to your story. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this special event. Thank you, Tali. Thank you, Rune, and all the people which are behind this event. 
Um, really glad that I can actually say something about the story of Patria because just uh, on Sunday we had a special event in the New Jewish Cemetery where is a memorial to remember all the people they died very close to the Haifa board and because now it's a special time for all of us it's uh, the pandemic it's the lockdown in Czech Republic still we were able somehow to commemorate this very tragic story and I would like to introduce you a little bit actually how it started what happened in Prague in the former Czechoslovakia and how the story starts for some of the Jewish people they decided to leave this country when the protectorate Bohemia and Moravia was set up. Uh, I'm using two diaries uh, in my lecture. One diary it's uh, from Karel Brandis and the second diary it's from Jiří Poláček and I think it will be very interesting also to hear what they said and also what they draw in their diaries. So now I hope everything will work. I will start to share my screen and I will start. Thank you so much. Just, uh, I would like to introduce the first picture. I think that some of you were able to visit the Jewish Museum in Prague. And I decided to put this first slide on the left with the menra and with the names of all the Jew of some of the Jewish people from my country, they perished during the Shoah. And this is from the Pinka Synagogue, which is the main memorial of Shoah in Prague. I said that I would like to just introduce a little bit how everything started. So 80 years ago, Czech Jews had a little choice. Either they would remain in the Nazi occupied protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia from where the Nazis would eventually send them to the gas chambers or they would take advantage or perhaps the last chance. He pays the way away and joins the anti-Nazi resistance in the future. Just before reaching this goal, 267 Czech Jews perished on November 25th, 1940, exactly 80 years ago in the port of Haifa. The pictures you are seeing right now, it's when the Nazi went to Prague and the Bohe protectorate Bohemia and Moravia was set up in the 15th of March, 1939. I choose these pictures because you can see the main and the oldest bridge in Prague, the Charles Bridge with the Nazis. And on the right side, the famous old town square with the astronomical clock, again with the Nazis. That day, everything changed for more than 120,000 Jews they were living in this country. You can see that uh, after the Munich Accord, already before the protectorate Bohemia and Moravia was set up, we started one part of the country was actually start to be part of the Nazi Germany, and we are calling this part the Sudetenland. So you can see the protectorate, Bemen and Mürin, Mürin, and in the middle, you can see Prague. When everything started, and the Nazis started to be the most powerful in this country, the life for all the Jewish people started to be very, very bad. We are talking about something, which is the terms of the historians, ghetto with no walls, which was between 1949 till 1941. We know that all the restrictions started to be used and mostly Jews were not allowed to go to the public places, they were not allowed to work and the schools were closed for the Jewish kids. And you can see just some of the examples which are in our archive with all the restrictions on the left side, it's the restaurant in two, always in both languages, Jews are not allowed to enter. You can see the hours for shopping. You can see also the new ID card for the Jews with a J on the top on the left side. And also, like I said, all the schools were closed for the Jewish kids, but still the education was the most important for all of us. So there is something like a, the school at home. And you can see also that uh, the children, they already have the star of David. They were older than six. But what happened then, the immigration options. We know that Czechoslovakia became an immigrant producing country during the second Czechoslovakian Republic. It means that after Anschluss, many Jews from Austria started to go through our, my country and they wanted to leave. But actually the escape was called euphemistically 
uh, emigration at the time. And we know that the leaving uh, the country was not easy. Most Western countries introduced visa requirements. Massive transports heading mostly to Palestine were reduced by the British mandate of Palestine. Many illegal transports went to Palestine and Chinese port Shanghai. In October 1941, the Jewish immigration is forbidden. This is the time when the mass transports for my country started to go first to Theresienstadt, Lodz, and then to the east. This is something very special for us, what we have in our archive. You can see the New Year's card by Beda Meyer from 1949, depicting the disparate situation of the Jewish refugees in Europe. If you will look above the F 1949, you can see Bizum, Permitted, Efidavit, etc. So this was actually the situation in 1949. This is the official letter, the British government official letter to the Czechoslovak government in exile, stating the Czechoslovak citizens are considered to be hostile foreigners. Like I said, in 1941, in October, mass transport started. So the people, they didn't have the chance to leave and they didn't decide to leave and they didn't have enough money to pay the visa and leave the country. Mostly they stayed and they started to be deported. As a transit ghetto was used, the Terzinstadt, which is 50 kilometers outside Prague and from Terzinstadt or Terzin in Czech, they were later deported to the east, mostly to Auschwitz Birkenau and to other places. You can also see that some of the transports went to the Lodge, to the Minsk and to the other places. If we will see this, slide, we can see that more than 80,000 Jews were deported from the Czech lands to the Lodz, Trozenstadt, and other camps between 1941 and 1945. 8,000 people that remain in hiding illegally in the protectorate were arrested or committed suicide. Just about 10,500 people were liberated. The Nazi final solution to the Jewish question was responsible for nearly 80,000 victims from the protectorate. So this was just the introducing of the story of the Czech Jews, because I think it's very important before we will start the patria story. You can see the famous picture, which was also on the invitation. There's written as var einmal, so this is the patria. Jewish, uh, if I will use the word of uh, Jiří Poláček, I would like to quote what uh, he said. He started actually with the disaster, but uh, we will come back uh, how everything started. 25th of November at about 10 o'clock in the morning, suddenly the morning and the ship began to tilt to the side, describes the situation on the Patria SS vessel, Jiří Poláček, who was one of the Jewish young people eager in Haifa to join the Czechoslovak unit of Karel Klapale. Karel Polacek described that the passengers on the Patria SS were using a painful journey, which began on September 2nd, 1940 at Prague's Masaryk railway station. Just the day before he had received a telegram from the eviction office, the headquarters who organizes the transportation of Jewish refugees. At a station, I met a friend who gave us a group of young people determined to join the Czechoslovak foreign army right on the train said Jiří Poláček. In Vienna, they switched to the steamer Melk, which is imprisoned along the Danube with another 700 refugees from the protectorate and from Austria to the Black Sea. We can see another diary from Egon Weiss, Egon Weiss actually, and you can see actually very nice picture in the way that you can see the Melk, Miloš and Patria. And we can see the Jewish refugees traveled to Vienna where they boarded a riverboat down in Romania, they buried Milosh, Melk, and Atlantic, three sisters' ships headed illegal for Palestine. There is like a from Berlin, Germany picture, crowds on the train, station platform, biding farewell to immigrants and road to Earth's Israel. From Carlos Brandeis' diary, the hour of the departure is near. Everyone's thoughts are turned away from the reality. My mother and my sister fought their way to the train and passed me some food. Boarding the train, everyone flocks to windows, a final glimpse, a final squeeze of hand.
I would like to continue what uh, Jiří Poláček is saying about the way. In Vienna, I already said, yeah, in, we can see actually that 70 people from Prague, 400 people from Vienna, cows run us. And this is also from the Karls Brandeis diary, which is already like the end, which is the Praha, Budapest, and then Tulsa, you can see Miloš Patra, athlete, young people dancing on the deck of the ship and wrote to Earth Israel. And here we are going back. In 1940, the British fleet discovered the refugees in the Mediterranean. The British Navy captured them and hauled the two vessels to the harbor of Haifa. Rumors were widespread that the intent was to deport these people to a desolate island somewhere in the Indian Ocean. In Haifa, the passengers were transferred to another ship, which the British intercept early called the SS Patria. Here we can see the Jewish the picture, which was actually to see the Patria explosion in Haifa. The Jewish committee and the Jewish official wore out every avenue possible to block the deportation. It was decided to physical damage the ship. We already heard about it. And this is very special letter. I don't know if you can see it. It's to Her Majesty, the Queen of England. And it's a very powerful letter, which was written uh, to her hands. And uh, it's the end, if you will, look on the button, do let us go to our children, do open the door of Palestine for us, do open the door of Palestine for us. This is, I think, very important to see that they tried to do as much as they could. It was written on the 22nd of November 1940, just five days before the explosion. From the diary, a bomb was smuggled about aboard on 24th of November, it exploded at 9 a.m. on 25th November. The Haganah had miscalculated the effects of the charge. It blew a large hole measuring three by two meters in the ship's side. The ship sank in only 16 minutes. The ship Patria sinking in Haifa Harbor. We saw already this picture. That morning I came to the harbor as I do every day. I went to my office of Solid Bonne. I stood there with David Hakohen and looked around to see what was going on. Then at nine o'clock, we heard a strong explosion. We watched helplessly as the Patria leaned on its side and sank. We immediately ran to the edge of the water to participate in the rescue operations. All the ships blew the whistles and every siren in the city sounded the alarm. Boats of every shape and every form appeared and began to approach the sinking ship. Arabs, Jews, every harbor workers, policemen, British soldiers, everyone lent a hand and was busy with the rescue operation. I would like now to mention what actually Jiří Poláček is uh, saying. Many people jump from the deck from a high of 12 meters into the sea and sail to shore. Others got stuck in the cabins and tried in vain to sell out to run windows, others to print more on the inside. Many got stuck in the windows, tore their skin and broke their limbs. Jiří Poláček escaped by jumping into the water. Quote, I had a fix that when a ship sinks, you make a whirlwind and that it happens to those people. I swam away from the ship until I swam to the pier, he said. When he exhaled, he swam back and helped with the rescue work. The refugees did not learn until later what actually happened. It was a desperate attempt by the underground Jewish organization Haganah. In fact, according to international agreements, all countries had to accept shipwrecks on their territory. Count on the team that if Patria is damaged, the British will have to take the passengers in. Patria was carrying more than 1,800 refugees. 267 people were declared missing. Many of the dead were trapped in Patria's hold and were unable to escape. 209 bodies were eventually recovered and buried in Haifa. Surviving refugees from Patria, together with the remaining 1,560 passengers of Atlantic, were taken to the Atlet detainee camp. Later, the survivors of Patria were given permits to stay in Palestine. 
the other Atlantic passengers were deported to Mauritius on December 9. After the war, 81% of them returned to the Palestine, August 1940. This is another story. This is Carol Brandeis. And this is something important to say, memorial at the New Jewish Cemetery in Prague. This is something special also to share with you. And it's uh, that my country was many years under the communist regime. So we were not allowed to commemorate any occasions which were connected with the Jews. So this is the old plague, which was actually on the wall of the New Jewish Cemetery, which is still in use. And just partly people were allowed to go and commemorate the victims of the Shoah and also all the tragical things, which is also patria. After 1989, after the Velvet Revolution, it was, it was moved to a main part of the New Jewish Cemetery. And you can see the current ambassador, Daniel Merum from Israel in the commemoration of the patria together with the uh, story of Tobruk, Dunkirk, when many Jews were also involved and died. On the right side, you can see the chief rabbi of uh, Czech Republic, which is actually Karol Sidon. I would like to say that uh, this is very important now for it, us that we can really commemorate and remember the past and share it normally and not just uh, inside a family. That's why I think that it's very important, not just for me, but also for the whole country to remember all the tragical stories from the past to learn and to say that never happened, that it will never happen again. I just would like to mention the sources I used, the uh, Archive of the Jewish Museum in Prague, Collection Yad Vashem, Collection United States, Holocaust Memory Museum, and also the Diary of Karl Brandeis, which was never published, and also the other diary. I just would like to stop to share my, my screen. I don't know if I'm going on time, but I just would like to say that uh, it was very fast, but I think uh, we heard the story basically from all of us. We know the story, but from my Prague perspective and Czech perspective, it's very important that I was able to share the story of the Patria today with you because it's a special event for us also. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, later on, open for the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pavlova. It was fascinating. And I uh, would like to, uh, to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Giora Goodman. Uh, and his lecture title is uh, Between the Patria and the Struma, British Propaganda, Censorship, and Jewish Wartime Illegal Immigration. Dr. Goodman is a historian. He chairs the Department of Multidisciplinary Studies at Kinneret College on the Sea of Galilee. His uh, research focuses on the relationship between government and media in British mandatory Palestine and the early decades of Israeli statehood. Dr. Goodman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good evening. I'd like to first of all uh, thank uh, Dr. Ronnie Michele Ariely and Professor Moti Golani for inviting me to speak in this special occasion. And um, it's always uh, something special to when uh, one can bring a perspective to those who actually experienced these events. And it's always uh, an added value. I'm gonna share share presentation that I uh, prepared. So, nothing like in a Zoom conference, a moment of silence. That's from my experience in the last six months. But not too long, so here we are. Okay, so uh, between the Patria and the Struma, and it's, it's going to be mainly the Patria and Atlantic, uh, British propaganda, censorship, and wartime illegal immigration. And I'm going to try and bring some of the British perspective into this, but even more so how things are presented. And uh, my short talk in this sense about propaganda and censorship surrounding Jewish wartime illegal immigration relates to a much larger and much argued question concerning the Jewish tragedy in the 1940s. 
and that is who knew when and what, and if what not, why didn't they know, and if they did know, how did they act upon this knowledge? And this searching question, of course, which is relevant to our days even more, as we experience so much of the world around us and our, the reality of it through the media, through uh, various, uh, well, today it's also social media, this, this question has been asked in recent decades about the Jews in Palestine and what they knew, Jews in Britain and the United States, which might have been able to influence their governments, and even more generally about governments, media, and public opinion in all allied countries, i.e. what did they know? And if they knew, could they do more about what they knew? This is a very big issue. And we're just looking at something here. And, and it was mentioned earlier that uh, this little known incident, why was it little known? It's the way it gets reported, of course. Another just introductory remark, and that is propaganda and censorship. These are flip sides of the same coin of persuasion. How do we influence? Propaganda means controlling the media on public opinion through disseminating your own information and opinions, with information, of course, being the polite word for propaganda, and censorship controlling the media and public opinion by preventing the dissemination and of competing information and opinions. And we're going to see really shortly here these two in play. On September 3rd, this is just two days after the world war broke out. In fact, it's the first official day of the war uh, because Britain de declared war on Germany and the Palestine government's public information office, of course, it's a public propaganda office, announced full pre-publication censorship on all press content in Palestine. And press censorship in Palestine would remain notoriously harsh throughout the war with security as often, and especially in wartime, providing the justification for what were also, was also political suppression. I'm using here because some of our audience can't read Hebrew. I'm using here the Palestine Post, but basically all news items that we will see would be printed verbatim also in Hebrew and in Arabic because this was Palestine law. So here we have censorship of mails and telegrams, which means that the government will control everything that is sent from Palestine abroad or to Palestine and pre-publication censorship of all newspapers, which means that nothing can be published without government consent. And nothing, this means in all sections of the newspaper, even news about sport or other matters. As to propaganda, Palestine's press law from 1933, which of course operated until the end of the British mandate, and even after, uh, into Israeli statehood included an extraordinary provision for Palestine government propaganda. This meant that newspapers had to print immediately, verbatim and free of charge, all official communications and denials sent by the government for publication. So we can see, for example, on the following day, on uh, this is September 4th, Palestine Post, the arrival of the first refugee ship which crashes on the shores of Palestine after the war began, and this is Tiger Hill, and there was a shooting incident there in which uh, a British uh, police boat fired a few shots at the, the ship before it beached, and uh, two of the refugees were killed. So you will see the story here on the front page of the Palestine Post, but before any, of course, censored independent reporting from the Palestine Post, you would first have here the official statement until this line, which reads that this is why it happened, why uh, shots were open fire, and usually the government is sorry, but he had to take this action, etc. So the government makes sure the people know what it is saying, even before one can hear independent press or media reporting. This combination of propaganda and much censorship, censorship was the key thing here, 
was forcefully applied during the serious incidents surrounding the deportation to Mauritius in late 1940 that are the subject of this uh, event. Press censorship prevented any independent reporting in Palestine of the arrival of the Milos and Pacific carrying refugees or the one day general strike in the Jewish community in their support. And if it wasn't published in Palestine, it was very, very hard for it to be picked up, nearly impossible by the foreign media. And of course, the British authorities are controlling the telegrams there too. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the British propaganda. So the British decision to the deport the refugees to an unspecified British colony. And of course, the Jewish agency knew that this is Mauritius, but it was impossible to write that in print. This was compulsory pr printing in the Palestine press. So we can see here on the front page of the Palestine Post, a day after a general strike in the Jewish community, of which not one word was published, we can see the official announcement of uh, the Palestine uh, administration that these refugees are going to be sent to a British colony and, in fact, will not be allowed to come to Palestine even later. And the British, uh, an interesting thing here is that actually at that time, the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, had actually decided that these refugees shouldn't, can stay in Palestine without going too much into this story, an urgent telegram had been sent to Palestine from the colonial office saying, we stopped the decision. But when they heard that it had already been published, then even Churchill said, okay, well, we'll have to carry this through because we've already published it. And that is the power of the media and of credibility. So one can look here in the map on the right, which is from 1940 for that's the little dot in the Indian Ocean where these refugees will be going to. The news of the explosion and the sinking of the Patria in Haifa Harbor was released in a short official statement. This is on the day, the evening in fact of the explosion and published on the following day on the 26th, accompanied by independent reporting of numerous eyewitness stories in the Palestine press. And as you can see here in the Palestine Post, which was also devoted to uh, much of the war's news on its front page, so you can see it on the left, two left columns, but in the Hebrew press, which isn't uh, writing also for the British administration, for British readers, and the British community, you can see it all across the front page. But first of all, official announcement that this is what happened. And the government is saying they were about to be sent to a British colony, unnamed yet. And here the, uh, the um, independent reporting begins of the eyewitness stories. And we should immediately ask ourselves, well, if the British are not allowing them any independent reporting of anything to do with the refugees arriving on three refugee boats, Milos, Pacific and Atlantic, which arrived the day earlier, how is it that we have independent reporting here? And not only that we have independent reporting, we have a lot of independent reporting. And the answer is very simple. The authorities saw no need to censor the grim and detailed daily reporting of more dead bodies being recovered, adults and children, as it was clear that the British held no direct responsibility for the tragedy. It wasn't printed and nobody admitted it, but everybody knew that if this was an explosion which was man-made, and that was the general assumption, this is carried out by the Jews themselves, whoever did it. And therefore, one can find in the Palestine press in the next two months, these daily reports of bodies being dragged out and their children, uh, adults, children, and their, their funerals. And all this is, of course, openly printed because the British authorities are not implicated in this in any manner. If anything, 
it was the guilt-ridden Haganah Organization Command and guilt-ridden by their own uh, memoirs and writings at the time and since, which felt the need to censor Hebrew press comment, sending David Ben-Gurion's son, son of the leader of the, of the chair of the Jewish agency, the executive, Amos, Amos Ben-Gurion, we can see him on the left, to physically assault, to slap his face of Yitzhak Lufbaum, the moderate-minded editor of the labor movement weekly, Hapoel Atzair. The weekly had made highly critical comments condemning the wicked hand that planted the bomb. In this respect, this whole incident, which is described in detail in uh, Professor May Hazan's uh, book about uh, moderation in the labor movement and in the Jewish yeshuv and that conflict behind the scenes, behind the moderates and the extremists on how to approach, how to approach the, 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 not just the problem of Jewish immigration, but their whole attitude to the British authorities and the restriction on Zionist activity. And this would go on, of course, until and into the late 1940s. But this incident is an example of the censorship of those who do not have the power to make law. Because the British government, of course, had law and an administration, the law of the land, to censor. While the Haganah could censor by violence. And that is to slap somebody's face. In fact, the weekly was uh, closed for a few weeks. And uh, this became quite a big uh, incident. Again, one can read more about it if you're interested. Um, but this is, uh, uh, just shows the difference between the way that the British authorities would look at an incident which they find no reason to censor because it's very uncomfortable. Even in the opening remarks we heard today about the Jewish hand in this and in this uh, tragedy. In an official communique issued on December 4th, the British authorities stressed their exceptional act of mercy in allowing the Patria survivors to remain in Palestine. And I highlighted a few sentences from this official communique. You can see it has to be printed on the front page here of the Palestine Post. But again, in Hebrew and significantly in Arabic too, um, in all Palestine newspapers. And it's allowing the Patria survivors to remain in Palestine, though saying, make no mistake, their number will be deduct deducted from the regular immigration quota and is stipulated in the, in the white paper of uh, May 1939, but also the determination to send all other immigrants as intended to a British colony overseas. So make no mistake, the, those who are not on the Patria will be going. And by the way, I heard uh, a couple of comments earlier that international law uh, provided that the refugees would stay. Uh, so again, make no mistake, in wartime, governments have very, can very easily circumvent in, uh, international law with uh, uh, various defense regulations. And in fact, uh, the, the, both the Foreign Office and the Colonial Office fully supported the view of the British Forces Commander in the Middle East to send the Patria uh, refugees also to Mauritius. And in fact, the only reason this didn't happen because we, was because of Winston Churchill's personal intervention. So all, all the Patria refugees who could stay in Palestine would have been going to and would have been sent to Mauritius too. Um, then comes, of course, the events that have been mentioned on the, sorry, the, event, uh, the events of uh, um, December 9th, the passengers of the Atlantic, who were very, who were very, and I wrote very forcefully because, you know, there's a very big argument about what exactly happened then, how, and uh, I tend to be, try to be very careful when there's uh, propaganda arguments about how much force we, was used. Um, and uh, of course, the Zionist had, side had an interest to, uh, to emphasize the way that the British treated the refugees and the British tried to claim that they actually treated the refugees in a, you know, not in a, in a tour or a brutal manner, 
but uh, uh, the removal of the uh, of the Atlantic refugees, sorry, to the from the deportation ship to Haifa Harbor, and sending them away, also no mention in the press. No mention whatsoever. Press censorship did not allow any report in the media of the refugees' courageous passive resistance, and about that there's no argument. Their forceful removal, about which there's no argument, nor did it allow any mention of the Jewish agency's protests. The deed was only made public 10 days later in a short news item, supposedly, because it's all a game, disseminated by Reuters from London. So you have Reuters, which carries out, is actually operating and the British government, uh, uh, um, you know, instructions at that time, uh, reporting from London that we learned from Jerusalem that refugees were deported from Palestine. And this can safely be published only 10 days later to make certain, and this is, was the important thing for the British uh, government, that there would be no demonstrations in Palestine. And in fact, as I said, I mentioned earlier in, in uh, uh, Meir Hazan's book, you can read about the arguments between the moderates and the more extremists behind the scenes, how to react to this first forceful removal of Jews from Palestine. And the government, of course, want to make sure that everything is as quiet as possible. And, and this they succeed. Another interesting thing is it's only on that day does the news get published and in the same small size in the international media, in the New York Times, in the Times in London, in the Manchester Guardian. I'm focusing here on Palestine because we only have 20 minutes. And I also want to make some remarks about the story, which I, seem, I assume that, that everybody here or nearly everybody know, knows quite a bit about, and that is the Struma, which comes a little later, British censorship was particularly severe. In the case of this refugee ship, the sail from Romania in the winter of 41-42. And the reason is that here, the British are implicated. This is their responsibility. And in fact, while the Struma was being held at Istanbul, and there was quite a lot of diplomatic activity between in the Jewish world and not just the Jewish agency, the World Jewish Congress and the British authorities and the Americans and nothing could be published in Palestine until the authorities gave way six weeks later and allowed news to be published in the Hebrew press. The Palestine Post was always the most heavily censored because the British knew that that's what the foreign correspondents read because they know English, they don't know Hebrew. But even in the Palestine Post, you can see this uh, editorial leader, 11th of February, 1942, floating death. How is it that you're keeping all these people on board for six weeks? But you could hardly get any news. So the American born editor of the Palestine Post who had an American visa, Gershon Agronsky, just left to Istanbul to see what's happening there. And he arrived there on the day that he heard that the ship had sunk. It's a story in itself, but, uh, and, uh, but here, just to, just to emphasize that here, the British authorities try to censor the news of its dragging to sea, sub subsequent sinking on the 20, for February 24, and the loss of all its passengers. But the Stroma case also shows very shortly the limits of censorship, even the strictest censorship in wartime due, due to the ingenuity of newspaper editors. We can see here all the Hebrew newspapers who were censored and could not print the news for a whole day that the ship had sunk, uh, put a, uh, this black, uh, line around the newspapers, but this was not only the only thing. Habokir, one newspaper, took a news item, a legitimate one, that a British liner had been sunk in the Atlantic and made it into a, a front page headline. And those who know, know, or as it said in Hebrew, Vehamevin Yavin. 
Davar, the newspaper of the labor movement and the most uh, widely disseminated legal Hebrew newspaper, took six sentences from Psalms, which the Palestine Post um, then uh, translated into English the day after, and uh, put them, these are all Psalms uh, sentences on the front page, which are all to do with mourning. And if you take the first letters of all the six, it adds up to Storma. So there were ways of defying censorship or coming around it. And as important, the development since the Patria incident and Atlantic of an alternative underground press. The Haganah established the Ishnav, which became the most widely read and disseminated newspaper weekly in Palestine. Because they didn't want events such as the Patreon Atlantic to go unreported to their members again. And this was disseminated by nearly 30,000 copies. And then finally, the existence of international broadcasting. The British couldn't stop the news because the news could be heard in Palestine through BBC broadcasts and others. And this is, of course, something that everybody knows with the censorship today. We have one last, one last uh, slide, and that is to, to conclude my talk, talk by point, because I can see my iPhone is telling me the 20 minutes are up in three seconds, so I'll take just 30 more, and that is the actual fact could not be censored in Palestine, what could be censored in Palestine was the adverse Jewish comment and criticism of the British government. This is exactly what happened with Patria and with Atlantic. But the key difference here is that by 1942, most pro-Zionist diplomatic activity, and even more importantly, advocacy, propaganda, was taking place abroad. And therefore, when the British censored a Palestine Post editorial, it was printed in the Mar Manchester Guardian through uh, Sir Louis Namier, the Weizmann's uh, right-hand man. So it was brought to the British audience. Or this man we can see on the right here, Josiah Wedgwood, which later became a refugee ship named person in himself, who was a massive supporter of Zionism by then in the British Lords, made a whole broadcast about Struma to the United States, which the British authorities tried to censor but did not succeed. 20 minutes about propaganda and censorship. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodman, for a fascin fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, uh, after the two very, very inspiring talks, I think we have uh, uh, time for a short Q&A. Uh, so I will start just a second. We have some questions on the chat. Um, um, the first is from Matan, just a second, uh, who asked, were there people who, after the explosion of the Patria, succeeded to, uh, uh, to enter into Israel underground and were uh, not deported? And I think this question can be directed uh, either to, to both of you, but uh, you can you can choose to to address it. I will give one more question before just a second. Sorry. Uh, uh, okay, so we have of course Peretz Chemi who asked for access for the photos and drawing presented by uh, Zuzana uh, Pavlovska. Uh, so Susanna, you can uh, you can address uh, this one, and we have Caroline who asked, "Was there an underground press to tell the truth?" So we'll start with the three questions. Um, uh, Dr. Pavlovska, you want to start? Uh, yes, I can start with the drawings. Actually, I use the drawings from the unpublished diary, which is in our archive, but we are trying to scan everything and to put it uh, online. So I can inform Tali when it will be done. 
and then you can use some of the, then the pictures will be visible and available for those of you who are interested. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Gior, do you want to address the, the underground uh, question, the underground press question? Well, uh, the, the underground uh, press, uh, first of all, uh, started uh, or began developing uh, just before the Second World War. One has to remember that until 1939, the Jewish uh, community in Palestine wasn't in open conflict with the British uh, mandata mandatory authorities. Uh, but illegal writing, especially uh, under some early illegal radio broadcasts begin even or just in the summer before the war. Uh, during the war, it develops. The Haganah have their own illegal press and quite a few of them, Ishnav the most important one. And then uh, there's uh, the illegal press of the revisionists and then of the Gun movement, its newspaper, illegal newspaper, Chilut, then after the state was established, became legal and became the newspaper of the Chilut movement uh, until uh, it was closed, not by the British, but by uh, commercial forces in the mid-1960s, which can be as strong, of course, as any government. I was also asked here, I can see about uh, Mayor Hazan's book, which I mentioned, so I quickly popped to my shelf nearby, this is the book. As I said, it's got an uh, it's got an excellent chapter. It's called in Hebrew Metinut, uh, in uh, English uh, Moderation. It's uh, the argument within Mapai, the labor movement, bit largest party, on how to respond. And it's got an excellent chapter on the argument of how to react to Patria, the Patria incident. And, and as I said, after the question of what we know comes immediately the question, okay, now that we know, what can we do about it? And getting other people to know is of course the way of getting other people to act about it. So the battle uh, about what will, be, um, what will be printed or broadcast or today published online is a very important one in driving people to action. And perhaps, perhaps if there would have been more international exposure and discussion of the Patria incident at that time, perhaps there would have been greater constraints on the British government to send people to the Indian Ocean because it's always harder for governments to carry out everything they want to do from uh, laying a train in Tel Aviv all the way to doing the most terrible things if there's uh, public accountability. And another thing, uh, or another quick uh, uh, question or something that is mentioned here, this, or oh, perhaps, Lonnie, did you wanna, do we have time for this? Yes, yes, we have. Are you referring to the reason that the Patria incident isn't learned in the Israeli yeah. schools? Yes, That's I think exactly it's an important what I want to lead to. Of course, when things aren't written about at the time, there's a tendency for them to uh, also have, uh, it's harder for them to appear in the history books. What do we historians do? We go to newspapers, we go to diaries as we saw today, we go to private accounts. The media is a very, very important exposure at the time already of incidents and things that don't get written about at the time, don't become part of public mythology, don't become, so if you, have something which is hardly written about at the time, it would be much, much harder to give it public exposure later. And I think that another reason why it isn't, um, it isn't, uh, or you don't hear so much about it, like the immigration after the war is again, because of the uncertainty of the Jewish community, how to respond. And if you try to respond, you even bring down a ship and uh, people's lives are lost, so you don't do anything. While after the war, from 1945, the story is very, very clear. Everybody's moral and brave on one side, and uh, the British are on the other side, and that's that. And that's a much easier story to tell than this uh, complex story of the Patria and its fate. I agree. And I, I just wanted, uh, we have a very important remark here by uh, Ilan uh, Benjamin. 
uh, about the fact that not all of the refugees that were deported to Mauritius uh, left in 1945. And it is true that uh, there is a group of uh, Viennese and uh, uh, Czech young men who were allowed to, uh, uh, to enroll into the British army uh, in, uh, in the late 1942 and 1943. Uh, um, and, and nevertheless, we have a lot of stories of Polish men who also tried to enlist and uh, were, were refused. Uh, so, and we know that some try to, to, uh, to also enlist to the, to the Jewish brigade. Uh, so it is true that uh, not all le left uh, after four years and, and seven months and some were released before. Um, and uh, we have another last question uh, uh, from Caroline about street protest in, in Palestine uh, in the 40s. Giro, Giro, maybe you can uh, give your input. Do you have any? Here again, how do we know about street protests? If they're not reported about in the press as the street protests are, from 1945 onwards, it's very, very hard to know what exactly was the extent. One can look at the leaders talking in their meetings and saying we had a demonstration here or there, and then perhaps they might report something. But it's very, very hard to collect an accurate information. And as I said, or even about something like the, the you know, the interaction and the violent interaction between the British police and uh, the Atlantic, the people who were there. So we have, thankfully, men like Oscar who can tell us still what they saw there. That would be the most important thing if it's uh, close enough in time. So you can have interviews or people who wrote in diaries, but it's very, very hard to, to find information where there's such blanket censorship as there was in the Palestine press in the 1940s. Yes, and I would just add from my work at the Zionist Archive that there were a lot of the Atlantic passengers who had relatives in Palestine, already in Palestine. We have some of you here with us in the, uh, on the audience. And, and from what I, uh, when I interviewed you, you all told me uh, that uh, how the British authorities did not let you have any contact with your brothers, sisters, uh, and other relatives uh, in Palestine during the short period that you were in uh, that lit camp. Uh, but we do know from the Zionist archive that those relatives had an association and they did try to, uh, to put some an effort in order to release their relatives from Mauritius during those five years. Of course, it was unsuccessful, but uh, we do uh, know from documents of the Zionist uh, uh, Federation and uh, the uh, uh, Jewish agency uh, that there was an effort and there was a lot of uh, uh, critique of Moshe Sharet and the Jewish agency for the, for the fact that they uh, did not do enough, didn't do enough in order to uh, release the refugees from Mauritius. And I think that we, we really need to, yeah, sorry. Uh, Would I to say that it's it yes, was very interesting in the point that uh, uh, if I'm thinking about the press here in 1940, uh, there was relatives, they waited for any messages from the closest, they were on the boat and they did nothing and they, they were in the situation expected the deportation to the places I mentioned. So if I if I'm looking on the press here and if I looked, it's uh, another story in the way that uh, they expected very good letters that they are saved, but they couldn't get nothing because uh, there was like a blind nothing. So it's another story that um, they hope for the better life for the people they were on the boat, but they didn't receive nothing and many of them died, so they never got the 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 answer actually what was happening there. Thank you so much. I will uh, I will give the floor back to Tali Nates because we are running out of time.
Tali? Yeah, th and thank you very much, uh, Ronnie, Susanna, and Giora. We could have probably spent another half an hour, and there's so many amazing comments and uh, uh, really interesting questions. What I suggest we do from the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center side is that we will keep all those comments and, 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 and uh, 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 questions and send those to Susanna, Ronnie and Giora and share, if you'll have the time, even if you can refer to articles or to readings, a lot of people are asking for more reading because it feels as if there's a lot more that we can investigate together. Uh, so we will do that in the coming days. And, and just to mention, because of uh, some of the, the, the comments in the, in the chat, that um, this year, for the first time ever, the government of the United Kingdom issued a, I would call it an acknowledgement letter. Uh, for what happened, what they, what what happened, you know, uh, in uh, British mandated Palestine uh, and the deportation to Mauritius, uh, it is the first of its kind. It's historical, and it was issued in August, and uh, this is available for anyone to see and read, uh, and it's certainly a first step, eighty years after. Uh, to um, acknowledge at least uh, what happened and uh, the importance of education and memory of, uh, of what happened. Uh, and I would like to thank Owen Griffith and uh, the Bobasan uh, Memorial and Information Center for making this possible uh, through their work with the High Commission of Great Britain in Mauritius. Um, uh, so, so more information will come your way, but I really want to thank everyone that participated from uh, Owen Griffith to Oscar Langsam to Ronnie Michela Rielli and Susanna Pavlovska and Giora Goodman to Professor Moti Golani that was part of the steering committee of this short uh, conference. And uh, of course, to remind our ex-detainees and all their families that you have about half an hour break now, but then we are meeting again together uh, for a reunion, uh, a first reunion uh, for, for many, many years to, to meet together in, at, at six o'clock Israel time uh, and, uh, and, Mauritius, and Mauritius time, it's eight o'clock in the evening, uh, Mauritius time. So again, thank you so much for everyone, for participating, for coming along and helping us really to remember uh, an episode that was marginalized for many, many years and uh, helping us to learn from each other. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you to all the partners and good evening. We will see you again, I hope, very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Giora. Thank you, Ronnie.